When people die, it's up to the rest of us, who are still here, to tell their life stories. That's how they live on, and that's why we call this podcast Immortalized. Every death stops someone's world when they hear about it. Some deaths stop the world for a moment because everybody knew who they were, but nobody was expecting it. In 2016, that happened twice in a row. That year began with David Bowie dropping an album on his birthday in early January, and then out of nowhere, dying from cancer. It was shocking because not even his friends knew he was sick. So three months later, when another one-of-a-kind rock legend who'd inspired millions, Prince, died suddenly from an accidental overdose of pain medication, it was like a body blow. It felt like the angels of music were being called back to heaven. At Legacy.com, the world's largest network of online obituaries, we watched as thousands upon thousands of grieving fans left condolences and shared memories in Prince's obituary guest book. But as shocking a death as it was for all of us, Prince Rogers Nelson had spent his life preparing for his afterlife. For one thing, the gigantic mansion he'd built as both his home and music studio, Paisley Park, was already more than halfway designed as a Prince Memorial Museum, pre-imagined to help preserve the life story of one of the world's most singular artists. And Prince also left behind a massive archive of unreleased recordings, which means his ghost will be singing to us for years to come. This month, his estate is releasing a full album titled Welcome to America that Prince recorded in 2010, but put on the shelf until now. This is Immortalized, where we explore people's life stories after they've died. I'm Steven Siegel from Legacy.com, and today we'll be talking about Prince's legacy with two writers who were among the first to make the pilgrimage to Paisley Park after it opened to the public following Prince's death. One of them is our co-host, Linnea Crowther. Hello. And with us is one of the nation's most prolific writers about Prince's legacy, Scott Woods. He's the founder and director of the Streetlight Guild, a performing arts organization based in Columbus, Ohio. And he's also author of the book, Prince and Little Weird Black Boy Gods. Scott, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I want to start by going way back, throwing it back to the beginning. Scott, you've said that Prince has been your favorite musician since you were a young boy. So what did Prince mean to you when you were growing up? Well, I encountered my first Prince record when I was about seven years old. And I didn't really know what was happening. He certainly hadn't blossomed into the Prince that we know today at that point. But uh, coming up, with him. In a way, we kind of grew together in a way, Um, despite the age difference. He was constantly reinventing himself, and that told me that I could constantly reinvent myself and that I shouldn't be afraid to try other things other than whatever I was into at the time. So I would vacillate between music and art and writing and just being a bad child, right? Um, (laughs) And Prince kind of made that okay. Do you sort of remember things in your life around the big landmarks of Prince's hits happening? Yeah, uh, (laughs) quite a few, actually. Um, But I, I, I really remember liking Prince for many years, getting jealous during Purple Rain, and then like probably a couple years after Purple Rain was hot, I really became a true and honest fan. Um, that would have been during like his second film. Um, and I was really enamored of the way that he decided to take control of his career and his music and his life. I was like, I, I need to do that. Like I was just tired of losing at everything all the time. I was horrible at school. I was, not yielding any of the results that I wanted creatively. And I just really drilled into what he was trying to do, like with his second film, let's say. 
right? Under the Cherry Moon. He directed that, you know, technically he wrote it, um, starred in it, wrote all the music. And um, that was really inspiring to me at the time. You know, I was like, I, I don't really know what I'm doing with my life, but whatever it is, I need to be in control of it, like at that level. And that's pretty much where I'm at today. Were there particular Prince songs or particular albums that spoke to you in a way that, that did something for your life? Yeah, I remember coming up, and this was before I was a proper fan, but I never forgot this song, All the Critics Love You in New York. This is off of his 1999 album. So this is before Purple Rain, right? And I just remember playing that song over and over, trying to figure out what the problem with critics were and what the problem with New York was. And as someone who's kind of grown into a critic, (laughs) um, I get it. But as someone who has visited New York, I still don't get it. But that song really kind of, you know, sold me on um, trying to figure out, like, what am I doing here? You know, what, what, and what will, what will the world's response be to what I'm doing? And how much should I care about that? And so that song has always been kind of a, I wouldn't say a mantra, but it's definitely always in the background. It doesn't hurt that it's funky, right? All three of us are Generation X. We all grew up hearing Prince in our most formative years. Um, Linnea, do you remember sort of your early awareness of Prince as a musician and, and how you responded to his work? You know, I certainly knew about his music before Purple Rain because there were you know, there were some hit singles uh, before Purple Rain, but Purple Rain, and I liked those songs too, but Purple Rain was when, you know, he really clicked with me as an artist. And I was, uh, I guess, probably 11 uh, when that came out. And my best friend had Purple Rain on vinyl. And I I can't even tell you how many times we turned that record over and over and over and just kept listening to it. Um, And, you know, kind of, in and out with some of the other hits of the day, you know, we're also listening to Cindy Lauper constantly at that time, but, but that was the one of the ones that we listened to all the time. So, you know, I knew this record just backwards and forwards, even though I didn't own it myself, it was my best friend's record. And I didn't even, you know, make a copy on a cheap blank cassette tape. I just listened to it at her house constantly uh, and, and knew it so well and had my favorites. Um, And, and I think probably still my favorite, uh, track off of that record is is Purple Rain. And and years later, you know, probably about six months, I think, after Prince died, I stepped outside before bed to walk my dog, and I heard some really otherworldly music kind of floating across my neighborhood from maybe a couple blocks away, and I couldn't place it at first. I couldn't figure out what was this beautiful music that was that was wafting through my neighborhood. And I finally realized that it was the end of purple rain. Um, I'm not going to sing it, but it's the part where he's just going, you know, Ooh, and there's some, some beautiful guitar. And, and it was, it gave me chills and, and gave me nostalgia for listening to that record over and over again as a, as a preteen. It's such an incredible record. And no idea where it was coming from. It was just sort of, some neighbor, your neighborhood. Yeah, some neighbor had it cranked because it's an amazing song. And, and you know, they, they didn't know they gave me that moment, but they did. So, April 21st, 2016. Scott, what went through your head when you heard the news that Prince had died? I thought it was wrong. I thought the news had completely gotten bad information. I was at work uh, that day. I had gone out to lunch. And when I came back from lunch, um, a coworker was like, hey, Prince died. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And so obviously I jumped on the internet and it was all, it, immediately it was just ubiquitous, <laughs> you know. Um, it was an inescapable moment. And it was extremely overwhelming for me. 
I should have left work that day and I didn't. Um, but I did have to like go into the bathroom and kind of get myself together, which was also very, um, which was also a very powerful moment for me, right? Because I'm not prone to that kind of emotion in general. And so part of processing that moment was, wow, that can't be true. And the other part of it is, why am I responding to this like that? You know, like my coworker knew that Prince was important to me. And so that made sense. But what didn't make sense to me was why I was physically like responding that way. Why was I crying in a work bathroom? It's like the most stereotypical response. Um, you know, to something like that, that I could think of for someone not like me. And right. so I had to process that on top of the fact that there wasn't going to be any more new Prince music, which was profound to me. I, I have to say, I, I, I was nowhere near as big a fan of Robin Williams as you are of Prince, but I, I will never forget being at work in 2014 in the afternoon and seeing the headline that that Robin Williams had killed himself. Mm -hmm. And I, I just couldn't, I did get up and turn off my computer and say, I'm done. And I left. Um, there was just this feeling that here is someone who, who not only did bring us all joy, but dedicated his life to bringing us all joy and now he was gone in a way that was completely unfair. And I, I just, I, I didn't know what to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, if I can add on here, please. Yeah. So, you know, for me, part of it, there, there were so many angles to the loss, which I didn't really conceive until they were happening to me in these waves, right, of realization. So on one hand, it was like, well, there goes all the new music. And then the next thing was like, well, there's all these business lessons that I learned from Prince and this work ethic that I got from Prince and this sense of self that I got from Prince and all of these songs that I used to convey things that I couldn't really convey to other people. Like all of that was almost, almost all of those things had just stopped. And uh, so it took a while for me to really kind of get a grip on what the loss was. It was so interesting to me to hear you say that you didn't believe it, that you discounted it, because the same thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've worked at Legacy for a million years. So I was working at Legacy that day and, and was already um, our our primary obituary writer at that time. And what we heard first was that somebody had died at Paisley Park. That I was remember the that. that came across that morning. And I didn't think for a second that it was Prince. My reaction was, wow, that's awful. That must be hard for Prince that someone died at his home. Mm. But I never even thought, but what if it's Prince? That never even occurred to me. Um, and then finally, you know, the news was clarified sometime after that. And we learned that, that it was Prince himself who had died. And it is, Stephen, I'm sure can uh, corroborate this. It, it's a weird experience to have to write an obituary for someone who you really admire, like, and it has to happen right now because yeah. you are uh, writing for the news. It's hard. It's hard to kind of just, you know, you, you just kind of have to push your personal sadness back. And and just detach and write the obituary, but it, it, that was a particularly hard one. And, and you mentioned Bowie early earlier, and that one was another one that was hard to detach and write that obit. Um, and and especially when I'm writing obituaries for musicians, I like to listen to their music while I'm writing. It kind of, you know, gets me in in the right headspace. And so I was just here listening to listening to Prince's music and and feeling this grief for him while also just needing to get the facts out as fast as possible because people wanted to know. Do you remember what you were listening to? 
I definitely would have been listening to a lot of the a lot of the reasonably early stuff. You know that that's really that's the era for me. Uh, you know that that sticks with me of his music. So I'm sure I listened to a lot of Purple Rain and uh, and you know stuff from a little before and a little after. You know maybe up into the 90s. I don't I don't know if I could tell you exact songs. It's been you know over five years now. Mm-hmm. I had almost the. In, in, I don't know. I guess I had almost the opposite but similar um, moment as a writer um, because I had so, you know, popularized myself with Prince, with people who knew me, with my audience, that I knew I was going to have to put something into the world as soon as possible, right? Just to kind of right. keep people off of me, you know, because mm-hmm. people were just like inundating me, you know, lovingly so. But they were just overwhelming me with messages and check-ins and this and that. And I was like, I got to get something out into the world before this becomes too much. Mm-hmm. And so um, I also, I guess, kind of had something akin to a deadline because I wasn't writing for anybody at that point. No journal was looking for that. No magazine, no newspaper. Um, so it was all just whatever it was, was just going to end up on my blog, which was for the best, right? So that I could kind of dive into the emotion which is kind of in a way the opposite of what you had to do um but i guess we both had our deadlines yeah in a way scott as a if i can use the word super fan as a super fan who is a writer you you almost had an experience that was not unlike a family member having to write an obituary Mm-hmm. As opposed to a journalist. Yeah, that's very fair. And you had to do it more immediately, I think, than most family members do. You can usually give it a day uh, as a family member, but it sounds like you did not feel like you could give it a day. You needed to you needed to answer everybody's questions, right? I gave it two. Okay. Um, there was I, there was like no way I was going to get that done the day of. Yeah. And even the day after was just like, eh, no. I think it took me two days to get there. So that makes it even more like what Steven said, that yes, mm-hmm. it, 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 it was very similar to maybe what a family member has to go through with that process. Definitely. You know, it, it's interesting. It reminds me, going back a, a couple more years, if there was one person I was a big fan of, um, it was Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock in Star Trek. And one thing about being a fan of someone who is now older, even elderly, is that you are aware of their mortality. And I, I remember um, at some point, you know, seeing Leonard Nimoy in a performance when he was already old and thinking, oh, geez, he looks like my great grandfather now. He's going to die at some point in the future. Mm. And I, I need to be emotionally prepared for that because it's going to be a big deal for me. And so like I, I had his mortality very present in my mind whenever I thought of him after that. And so when he did in fact die and I was working at a newspaper, I was, I was mentally prepared to sit down and write something about it. Um, and it strikes me that this is one of the things that was at play with Prince, um, was that we weren't ready for that to happen. Mm-hmm. It was it was a death that felt untimely, and that probably impacted some of the ways that we thought and felt about it. Yeah, he was, what, 57, right? Yeah. I, I believe he was 57. And yeah, that's... It, it, it was especially shocking because of his reasonably young age. And, and yeah, nobody was thinking about Prince dying. He was just seemed kind of immortal, I guess. Yeah, you know, what was a trip for me, too, on that note, was I was like, how do you, how does Prince die? Yeah, you well, know? I was like, before it was clear what the reason was, I was like, how was who would kill Prince? How would Prince die? You know, yeah, it was, right. and he had just like performed like like a week before that, you know, and um, and so it was just like so you know he was clearly not, um, you know, laid up anywhere, you know, 
with like a long-term illness or even a quick short-term illness. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like trying to figure out like how, how, and then, you know, when they mentioned the drugs thing, I was just like, mm, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't know what to do with that. And as, as the details come out on something like that, it's, it's a picture that applies to any number of families, you know, in any number of circumstances where, um, you know, we, we don't think about someone who is just trying to treat an illness as being susceptible to something that can be called a drug overdose, mm -hmm. but it's a thing that happens. Um, you know, none of us are guaranteed that next day, no matter how rich or famous we are. Yeah. So I'm curious, Linnea, Scott, you both live in the Midwest, just like Prince did. He, he made his life in his hometown of Minneapolis. So I'm curious, do Midwesterners have any special perspective on Prince's legacy that's maybe somehow different from how the rest of us think of him? I think the people of Minneapolis, St. Paul absolutely do, but, but I am not one of those people. But I think that he's he's so um, so Minneapolis, and, and you know everybody in Minneapolis has a Prince sighting story to tell that that they 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 remember and was a special moment in their life. I I don't know that I have anything to say about the the Midwest as a whole regarding Prince because I feel like he's just Minneapolis through and through. But maybe Scott does have something. I do. Um... And this will come largely from being a Midwestern black person, mm -hmm. um, you know, coming up, uh, I, especially like if you talk to people who were from one of his favorite cities like Detroit. Um, but in general, I think that if you talk to black people from the Midwest about Prince, you know, there's a sense of him not the way that I think people from the coast who are used to fame and are used to seeing celebrities in the streets and that sort of thing. Um, you know, it, I think it's different for us a little bit. It's, it was kind of like your cousin made good. And so we were always rooting for Prince, even when we weren't always a fan of some of the albums or decisions or whatever. We were always rooting for Prince. You know, it was like that's my cousin, <laughs> you know, that's my, that's my play cousin. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's definitely different than I think how people like say from the coast um, perceive someone like Prince, you know, they're kind of used to people like Prince, um, although Prince is unique, you know, they're just, they're kind of used to celebrity and they're used to, um, you know, and they have industries and things just down the street from them that contribute to celebrity and fame and the Midwest does not by and large, it does not, which is why, you know, Prince had to create it. And I, I think that speaks to that phenomenon of how people who had, who did have a Prince sighting in Minneapolis, uh, you know, everybody's got that story to tell because it was a big deal. He was so committed to staying in his hometown, even when he, you know, could have moved to LA and, and been like every other famous person in LA or could have moved anywhere he wanted. Um, but but he stayed and and kind of yeah made that made that special version of fame because he he was set apart I guess from from other celebrities like you say mm -hmm. you know as I think about it too you know there was always a spunkiness to Prince that I think is very Midwestern um, where you know. It's, there's all these things that should have been a challenge to Prince and, and that were a challenge to Prince that he just constantly overcame, um, you know, his age, his size, you know, the way that he looked, the way that he wanted to engage versus how people decided to engage. You know, he just was constantly fighting against those things and trying to come out of, you know, an extremely competitive person. And, um, I would venture to say that that too is kind of a Midwestern thing, at least the way that it translates with Prince. You know, Prince had to build much of the machine that was around him. 
by him, you know, himself with his own two hands in a way. And um, because he was fiercely independent. And I think that that's kind of a Midwestern value, right? That kind of fierce independence. Um, You know, we don't have, you know, 20 major publishers in our towns. Uh, We don't have Hollywood lots in our towns. Um, We don't have a lot of major recording studios in our cities. And so um, the fact that Prince wanted to stay in his pond and build that is amazing to me and extremely Midwestern. So he stayed in Minneapolis and he built this palace, (laughs) this high tech mansion, this compound. He created his own place, Paisley Park. After Prince died and after eventually and sooner rather than later, Paisley Park opened to the public as a museum. Both of you spent some time visiting there, walking through this personal space where Prince had lived and where he'd made his music and where he'd made his magic. What were some of the things that you saw at Paisley Park that conjured Prince for you, even though, you know, of course he was gone? So there are, there are a lot of places at Paisley Park, a lot of areas that I think are specifically curated with the intent of bringing prints to life for you. Um, and, you know, by curated, I, I really mean it's, it's a museum and they've, they've created these spaces that are supposed to, you know, bring to mind his music and his, his work. But for me, the places where Prince really felt like he, he could have just stepped right back in the room at any moment. Uh, those were the spaces where he, he did actively work that are not really museumified. They are just kind of still look the way they did, or at least when I was there several years ago, they looked the, the way they did when he was working there. So that's um, like the, the music studios, the recording studios, of course, where he both performed and recorded his music. And like in one of them, back behind the mixing board, there's a stool where Prince used to sit and sing while simultaneously mixing his his own music, which of course is so Prince, you know, the way that the way that the you know control and having everything exactly the way he wanted it was so very important to him. So important that he was both singing and mixing his his music at the same time. And there was another room uh, called the editing bay that was where he would sit and watch hours upon hours of footage uh, of performances, you know, his his own and with his band performances and uh, kind of like a, you know, play by play watching after the fact to see what worked, what was good, what do we want to do better? What do we want to practice? What do we want to cut? Because it didn't really connect with the audience. But you know, what do we want to build upon? Because they loved it. And we want to keep that in there. And just knowing how much time he sh- obviously spent in that room making his performances more perfect uh you you see the couch where he sat to watch that stuff and you can just see him sitting on that those those were the two big spaces for me where even though you know there are pictures of him all over and you hear his voice coming through the speakers everywhere those places seem like where he still exists yeah i concur um i actually went to Paisley Park before it was open, right? So I was outside the gate like a bunch of other people um, after his death. And there wasn't any plan to open it at that point. I was just visiting it just to pay respects. And it was a trip because I thought like, okay, it's like a Wednesday or something. It's like noon. It's the middle of the day. Nobody's going to be there. I'll be able to like creep up there and have my personal moment. And it was like 50 people milling about the fence, putting stuff in the fence, looking at all the things that had been put into the fence. How long after his death was this? Was this immediately or some weeks? It was, um, oh, wow. Actually, it's when Stephen and I met. So um, probably a couple of months, I guess. Okay, and there's still that many people there paying his back. Yeah. Well, you know, no one knew that they would ever be able to get inside. And so Mm -hmm. that's all we had. And um, 
And so, you know, I, I did that. And then um, several months later, they started talking about, oh, we're going to open it up. And so um, me and a couple of new friends that I made, uh, we made that journey on the second day that it was open. And um, things were still pretty rough, right? Like it was like, you know, there were things that they were trying to sell you on, like, oh, this is exactly the way it was when Prince mm-hmm. passed away. And it's mm-hmm. like, no, it's not. But, <laughs> like the, um, hat, the hat that he supposedly left on the piano that, yeah. yeah. That was kind of <laughs> right, yeah. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, and, and and they've since changed a lot about that experience, right? So if you go now, if you read the stuff that I wrote about, like visiting uh, Paisley Park at that time, a lot of that will be different now. And that's as near as I can tell, that's all changes for the better. Um, one of the most notable things is, you know, you walk into Paisley park and you're in the lobby. And at that time they had, you know, this Paisley park shaped urn that had his ashes. Mm-hmm. Um, well, they just had that sitting in the middle of the room. And when you came in, Uh, Nobody knew that's what it was until a tour guy would tell you, oh, and by the way, here are his ashes in this structure in the middle under glass, of course. But here it is. And everybody just turns around and they're all we're all shocked because it's like, what do you mean? I've been standing five feet away from his ashes. You didn't tell me that. And so it was this really weird, morbid, powerful, effective moment, you know. You know, I think I must have been there a couple months after you. And and I think that the reactions of those of you and the early visitors, I think they kind of figured out that, whoa, this isn't something to just spring on people. Yeah. And it was it was higher up. It wasn't just in the middle of the room. They moved it. Yeah. Yeah. They moved it higher up. And then they would really respectfully and solemnly, you know, tell us what we were looking at and then actively give us a minute to deal with it. Yeah. Because people were, you know. They weren't falling out, but they were definitely like crying and like Mm -hmm. the tour stopped, (laughs) you know. And um, another thing that really struck me, and this was even more, I don't know how to say it other than it's a little morbid, but you realize when you come in that if you are familiar with Paisley Park at all, like if you've watched like the Oprah interview um, you realize that there was an elevator there in the lobby that you can't see now. They've walled it off, but that's where they found him. Mm-hmm. And you don't realize that until, unless you're really hip and you, and you know where that is. And so for a long time, when I came into the lobby, I was looking at the walls and I was like, what is this weird cross section here? Cause it's like still a doorway, right? It's a working elevator. So they don't want to like, just get rid of the elevator, but they have to hide the elevator. And so I was just like, what is this wall? And then I, when I thought about it, I was like, oh, right. That's what that is. I think our tour guide pointed out the elevator to us, Ugh. which is weird. Yeah. It's a little weird. I want to go back a second to the urn, because this is really something. Never even mind the springing it on you as a surprise that happened to you, Scott. But I, I want to look at the, this actual thing that was happening. So inside Prince's mansion, there is a model of Prince's mansion, and that's what his remains are inside. Yes. Yes. Most, some of them, yes. I think there, you know, I think there might have been a split of the ashes, right? What is that about? Prince never left the building. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And and the way that they kind of present it now with the urn elevated is that Prince is kind of watching over mm-hmm. Paisley Park and the people that and come And in, in addition to that placement of the urn, uh, aren't there also there's there eyes on the on the wall, high up on the wall, mm-hmm. maybe over a doorway right at the beginning of the tour there? Yeah, right on the wall as you come eyes. in. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, you know, r- almost and, literally with those eyes on the wall watching over you. <laughs> and they're very explicitly Prince's eyes. Yeah. There was something else that you wrote about, Linnea, when you talked about visiting Paisley Park, which was the idea that there's an interactive space where 
you can sit down at a piece of the music studio and record yourself singing with Prince's music. Is that something that's still happening? I don't know if it is. We didn't get to do it. That was only, I think, on the Thursday tours, maybe. And we were there on a Friday. We weren't there on the right day to do it. But you do get to play, or we did get to play ping pong on Prince's ping pong table. So that was interactive and fun. But I don't know if they're still letting people record a clip. I know that, you know, as Scott said, it's changed and it's been uh, over four years since I was there. And Scott, I have re- you been there in the interim? Yes, I had actually. Um, but it's been a couple of years since at this point, And I know things have changed even since then. I went to one of the annual celebrations that they started having there mm-hmm. um, after his death. And those are like four day long stays. And so you, you know, you go to Minneapolis, they shuttle you to Paisley Park and you're there all day for four days straight. Um, touring the building and bands are coming into play and associates that knew him are talking. It's a whole conference basically. And so I was there, you know, like I said, a, at this point, probably a few years ago um, for one of those. And that was, that changed my relationship to it as well. Right. Because now I'm in Paisley park as if it were normal, you know, as if I belong there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the tours were a little different and the displays were a little different. And that was only maybe like a year or two after my initial visit. So that place is constantly in flux, um, which is a, a testimony to Prince's, you know, prodigious output, right. Of fashion and music and ideas. Cause there's, there's so much that they could kind of put all over the place to really, get you engaged. Um, And I think that it's awesome that they're doing that. They're kind of, you know, kind of keeping the thing alive in a way. Yeah. Nobody expected that it was going to have to be turned into, you know, solely a museum right away. And I think that, it, you know, Prince's vision of this place was that it was always going to be this incredibly creative space and, you know, other musicians recorded there. And, and I think that if that's something that can keep happening in the future, you know, that's, that's the best way of paying tribute to, to somebody as creative as Prince is to, is to keep that a creative space. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I'd like to share a story that one visitor to Prince's obituary on Legacy left just a couple months ago. Um, This was in February 2021, five years after Prince died. And this condolence read, I met Prince while walking to a bath and body in Kenwood in Cincy. He walked over and put my hands into his, and I was wondering, who is this man holding my hands? I just stood there and I didn't say a word. After a few minutes, he released my hands. He gently laid his hand on my shoulder as I started walking on my way. I stopped because it hit me that that was Prince. I turned around to find him. It was too late. I didn't see him in the crowd. He had a kind and gentle spirit. This old lady thinks about him every once in a while. And when I heard the news that Prince had died, it laid heavily on my heart. I did go out and buy some of his music since I had none. I wanted to know what kind of music he had made. I wished I had talked with him when I had the chance and told him about Jesus. So there's this thing about Prince where it seems like everyone who has a Prince story to tell, it's something like this. There's this mystique where he presents as a transcendent figure. You know, he's almost angelic somehow. How does that happen to a person? And how does that affect the legacy he leaves behind, Scott? So that's an interesting story, right? Um, the the veracity of which we cannot verify one way or the other. Of course. Um, it sounds like a lot of similar stories that I hear from the Prince fan community. Um. And without getting into the story itself, but to get to your question, 
Um, a lot of that is, you know, self-imposed mystery, right? Prince understood, really understood how to um, leave you wanting more constantly. He, with everything that he gave you, you know, there was always three more things that you could tell he was reserving, you know, holding back. And because he just basically refused to interview for, you know, most of the time that he was here, you know, he refused to do interviews. He, you know, he only very late in his life decided to write anything autobiographical, right? His unfinished book which somehow tells you so much more about him. And yet at, you know, 50 pages of original manuscript handwritten by Prince still leaves you wanting a hundred times more than what he gave you. Sure. Um, he was just a master at, uh, at that kind of chess game of mystery, um, you know, to his benefit and his detriment, in my opinion. Um, and all of that, coupled with the iconography in his music, the larger-than-life persona, the larger-than-life abilities, the constant struggle between the religious and the secular, um, but but more times than not falling on the religious, especially in the latter half of his career. Um, you know, the, constantly, the constant reinvention, um, all of that just really served to make Prince seem more than human, you know, while he was here and even more so now that he is gone. It felt like in 2016, one of the reasons why everyone was, was talking for a while about, oh my God, so many people are dying in 2016. It wasn't even necessarily that it was so many people. It was, it was that David Bowie is one of a handful of people who did that same thing that Prince did, right? You know, he he cultivated this aura of of transcendence around his very identity. You know, he was always changing. Who was he really? He was so beautiful. He was such a genius. And he never let you all the way in. Mm -hmm. Um and it's one thing to lose one of these people, but to lose two of them in a row, what's going on, right? It is as if you've lost the concept of mystery, right? Right. I, I, I remember, to take this into real nerd territory, I, I remember when Prince died, coming on the heels of Bowie dying, I, I immediately flashed to the idea in the Lord of the Rings of the elves are leaving Middle Earth. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the world has become dimmer all of a sudden because the magic is gone. Yeah. And, you know, and that's compounded by those two artists very specifically, right? Prince was still a working artist. You know, he was launching a world tour. At, in a way in which he was completely deconstructing who and what Prince is in the public eye. So if you'll recall, the last tour that he was on was just him and a piano. No band, no pyrotechnics, no opening act, just him, the audience, and a piano. That was the whole tour. That's a complete deconstruction of Prince, right? It's almost like the, watching the film Unforgiven watching Eastwood deconstruct this iconic cowboy figure. And Prince right. was in a very similar place. Also, I, I don't think I'm reaching here to say that this was one of the ways in which Prince would begin to put his hands on establishing what would become legacy for him, like in, in a very um, Maison scene way, right? Um, he's like, okay, I really need people to understand what kind of musician I am and have been. Um, and so, you know, we get this tour. But Bowie was very similar, right? Bowie is dying. He knows he is dying. And he puts out Black Star, this incredible record 
that is so self-aware of his mortality. And the videos that go with that are completely haunting. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I completely concur. Like just losing those two um, so close together and the way that they were um, engaging their legacies and their p- possible futures or their past and their mortality is, you know, is just, I, I don't know that as a society we've completely processed how that all kind of played out yet. I think we're just kind of still feeling our way through it. And don't forget, you know, of course, 2016 was a famously rough year. And don't forget that just a few months later, you know, we we lost Carrie Fisher, who mm. kind of ended up with that same canonization after her death, something that we've kind of talked about, Stephen, of just... um we we weren't we didn't expect it we weren't ready for her to go and it elevated her to this you know kind of worshipful state after her death right this was someone who played a role in our childhood picture of the world mm-hmm. and she was still with us and it wasn't until she wasn't that the sort of enormity of what her art had given us really sank in mhm You know, Scott, talking about Prince still being a working musician at the time of his death. So now there's a new album. The estate has released this record, Welcome to America. Um, Or they're about to, I should say. Uh, They've released the first single, which just dropped the other day. Um, Tell us about it. Is it good? About the record or the single? (laughs) About about the the single to start off with. Um, sure. The single that's well, we've heard two songs technically off of this album to date, but the one that feels most like a single, um, "Born to Die," uh, recently just dropped, and it's uh, it's a it's a really cool song, right? Like it, it has this. It's an answer to the question, or actually to the to the comment, as I understand it, that, you know, Prince had heard or was told that he wasn't no Curtis Mayfield. And so he wrote this song, which is a very Curtis Mayfield sounding song, but it has uh, this theme where he's interrogating America and what it means to be black in America. And apparently much, if not all of this album is doing that. And this is in 2010, right? Um, you know, Obama is president. Arguably, to some people, Prince shouldn't have this problem, right? This shouldn't be his concern. But we have to remember, you know, that Black Lives Matter happened on, on Obama's watch. You right. Know? So um, none of these things really ever go away, which is why... Prince's album, or at least the the stuff that we know about it so far, just looking at the song titles, you can kind of tell where it's going, um, seems so prescient, right? Um, And it's not. It's just that this is kind of the state of being Black in America all the time. It's interesting because thinking about Prince working at the moment of the Obama years, Prince and President Obama were both people who I think have been described frequently as being notable in part because they speak so powerfully to both black and white audiences at the same time, right? Yeah. But their own life stories are stories of being black in America. And it seems like one of the ways that they had that crossover impact was that white audiences heard both of these men as as transcending race somehow whereas a black audience would hear their words very differently and I'm trying to think back to when I was a kid listening to Prince on the radio and you know what my consciousness of race was or wasn't at that time, you know, as a 
grade school kid, a middle school kid who lived in a small town that was almost entirely white. I think there was one black kid in my class. And, you know, it wasn't until I grew up and went to college and moved to a city where I met more people and discovered how much culture was lacking in my picture of America and my neighbors. But as a little kid, not having that perspective, I don't remember engaging with Prince's work on the level of him being black specifically. Um, if anything, at that time, it was his sort of androgyny that was more visible to me. Um, Linnea, I don't know if that resonates to your experience or not. I mean, you know, of course I was aware that he was black because I was a, you know, I loved watching MTV, so I certainly would have seen his videos. But And, and I was also just a, a really devoted radio listener kid. I loved music. And I, I often, you know, the, when you're nine or 10, as I would have been when I first heard Prince, you love what the radio tells you to love in some ways, you know, you don't love everything, but, but I knew that Prince was, was awesome because I heard him on the radio. I loved his songs and it, it kind of didn't matter. Um, I also grew up in a, in a very different kind of town. Um, and, and my schools that I went to were, were real diverse. And so I, you know, did have a lot of exposure to kids my own age who were all variety of, uh, of colors and races. Um, so, and probably also heard more music by black artists because of that. But I don't, I don't know. It just, it, to, to me, it just, he was, he was an artist and that, that was what was important, I guess. And I don't want to discount his blackness because I know it's a very important part of his story, but I guess it's not what a 10 year old was thinking about. Uh, you know, I was just loving his music. On the other hand, Scott, you've written a whole book it's titled Prince and Little Weird Black Boy Gods. Yeah. What does that mean? What what does Prince's life story hold from a black American's perspective specifically? So it's become really important in recent years uh, since his death to tie Prince firmly and clearly to his blackness. Like that's become exceedingly important. Um, he, it, when he was alive, a lot of the people for whom that issue was important or that observation was important, you know, we largely resigned ourselves to, well, it's so obvious. Why do I have to speak on it? And there he is doing black things. He's saying Black Lives Matter, right? He's writing right. a song for Baltimore. He's donating money to the families of shooting victims and, and so on and so forth. He's doing all of these things clearly in the interest of his blackness, right? Um, and so there wasn't a lot of stuff that we needed to say, right? Prince was kind of doing all that work anyway. We just had to kind of occasionally remind people that that work was happening. Well, that kind of changed with his death. Um, because black people know how these stories go and the story is important. Narrative is important. Um, it's how you define in a lot of ways. It's how you define legacy and Prince's legacy is vastly important, but it's more important to get it right. It's a trip when you kind of look at how people process Prince that way, um, racially, I mean. As people's interpretation of around things like race and racism, as those things changed or matured or what have you, um, they have turned around and looked at Prince to see how that translates. And the thing about Prince is that he was never not being Black. And he was never not really saying, I am not Black. He never said that. He would say these very... Um, lofty things, these aspirational things, like I really wish people would not think about race. And people would interpret that, you know, as him suggesting that he didn't see himself as black, which was not true at all. 
And right. because Prince was extremely aware of that perception, he stopped making those kinds of claims. And if you look into his music beyond the hits, you will see song after song after song, um, you know, over the last 20 years of his career, if not longer, you know, where he drills this point home, right? Um, and so to me, at this point, if you think that that was Prince's position, that he transcended race or he didn't uh, consider race or he didn't want to be seen as black, you are completely misinterpreting Prince 100%. He would tell you that, and, I mean, and if nothing else, if nothing else, you don't have to take my word for it. Take Prince's word for it. You know, there's a book out. He wrote 50 pages of it. He makes it extremely clear what his position is. But it's really important to get that right. And and, and it's okay to to talk about it is the thing. I think that you really have to convince people of, especially in this day and age, right? Where history is becoming illegal. <laughs> right. I, you know, it's funny. I, I remember specifically um, back in the 90s, Prince was not someone who was particularly renowned for covering other people's songs, right? He was a great songwriter. That was his thing. Mm -hmm. He didn't need other people's material. Um, but he did a cover of the song, One of Us, uh, that Joan Osborne made famous, that, that Eric Bazilian wrote, the song, What If God Was One of Us? And I remember listening to it, thinking it was a great cover, and being struck by the fact that the only word he changed was he changed the line, what if God was one of us, just a slob like one of us, to what if God was one of us, just a slave like one of us. Yeah. And I was young enough to simultaneously think, well, that's aesthetically less pleasing because it doesn't rhyme, but also... <laughs> Mature enough to think, but that doesn't matter because he's saying something important. Right. And I thought it was so interesting that he, he latched onto that, that one song that he didn't write as worth, like worth picking up and then worth making that change to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know that I have anything to add to that. Yeah. <laughs> So in looking at Prince's legacy, there's a distinction that can be made between the legacy he tried to create for himself and the legacy that people are perceiving and shaping and telling today. Are they the same? I don't think those things are the same for anybody. And that has to be hard for somebody like Prince to like recognize, you know, I'm sure he, he was aware of that, uh, maybe especially aware of that because of his frustrations with the lack of control at times in his career over his music and his public image. But yeah, no, nobody, nobody gets to decide how people are going to remember them uh, for sure. You know, it's unfortunately not how it works. I agree. Um, the only thing that I would really add to that is that I think Prince uh, stands out a little bit from this rule. Um, he His version of legacy and what we're kind of doing to it, they're in, you know inextricably linked, obviously. But Prince spent years uh, crafting so much about how he would be perceived. And we have just kind of carried that into the now, into the legacy that we are building without his input, without his say. Um, and he's certainly not the only artist who's ever done that or person who's ever done that. But um, he invested a lot of time and energy into crafting uh, not just a, a version of Prince, but a version of how to live. 
So for instance, you know, Prince makes reinvention okay. It's okay to just start over. However deep you want that reinvention to go, however personal, however public, that's up to you. And you get to decide that. That's a powerful thing to uh, put into the world. That's a powerful value to put into the world. And to Stephen's previous question about like how that relates, you know, to, to Black America, like that's a powerful lesson for us, right? For people who are constantly being stereotyped, who are constantly being, you know, oppressed on on every way imaginable, um, to that we get to define, that we get to take hold of our self definition, and that's just one of the things, right? Um, that Prince essentially teaches you how to do. Um, And so Prince's legacy isn't just music, right? It's also kind of value-based. There's all these life lessons in Prince. Um, And some of that is stuff that, you know, we have to kind of build, but some of it is there and it's obvious. We just have to kind of dust it off and attach to Prince the way that it needs to be attached. you know, for it to kind of function in society moving forward in a productive way. But, um, you know, there's there's probably a self-help book in Prince that has very little to do with his actual songs, right? Um, there's a lot in Prince still yet to, un- to discover, even though he doesn't give us many answers. But he gave us a lot of questions that we're still thinking about now. Really great questions. <laughs> On that note, that is our time for today. I'd like to say thank you to Scott Woods, who is the author of the book Prince and Little Weird Black Boy Gods. You can also find his writing recently at the New York Times, on Medium, and at his own blog, scottwoodswrites.net. Follow him on Twitter at at Scott Woods says. Thank you also to our sponsor, Legacy.com, where now you can honor a loved one's memory by planting memorial trees in their name. Just visit Legacy.com slash trees. To hear more life stories like the ones we talked about on the podcast today, you can subscribe to Immortalized on your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just look up Legacy.com on YouTube. And if you're on Facebook, you can follow Legacy.com there for daily updates. Thanks so much for listening.